Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian. Epistle 74, from Milian, Bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia to Cyprian, against the letter of Stephen. Argument. The argument of this letter is exactly the same as that of the previous one, but written with a little more vehemence and acerbity than becomes a bishop, chiefly for the reason, as may be suspected, that Stephen had also written another letter to Familianus, Hellenus, and other bishops of those parts, to the effect that he would not hold communion with them so long as they should persist in their opinion concerning the baptism of heretics, as Eusebius tells us from a letter of Dionysus of Alexandria to Zixtus, the successor of Stephen. Ecclesiastical History, Book 6, Chapter 4 Familianus, to Cyprian, his brother, in the Lord, greeting. We have received by Rogatian, our beloved deacon, the letter sent by you, which you wrote to us, well-beloved brother, and we gave the greatest thanks to the Lord, because it had happened that we, who are separated from one another in body, are thus united in spirit, as if we were not only occupying one country, but inhabiting together one and the self-same house, which also it is becoming for us to say, because, indeed, the spiritual house of God is one, quote, For it shall come to pass in the last days, saith the prophet, that the mountain of the Lord shall be manifest, and the house of God above the tops of the mountains, end quote. Those that come together into this house are united with gladness, according to what is asked from the Lord in the psalm to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of one's life. Whence, in another place, also it is made manifest that among the saints there is great and desirous love for assembling together, quote, Behold, he says, how good and pleasant a thing it is for brethren to dwell together in unity, end quote. For unity and peace and concord afford the greatest pleasure not only to men who believe and know the truth, but also to heavenly angels themselves, to whom the divine word says it is a joy when one sinner repents and returns to the bond of unity. But assuredly, this would not be said of the angels who have their conversation in heaven, unless they themselves also were united to us, who rejoice at our unity, even as, on the other hand, they are assuredly saddened when they see the diverse minds and the divided wills of some, as if, not only, they do not together invoke one and the same God, but as if, separated and divided from one another, they can neither have a common conversation nor discourse, except that we may in this matter give thanks to Stephen that it has now happened through his unkindness that we receive the proof of your faith and wisdom. But although we have received the favor of this benefit on account of Stephen, certainly Stephen has not done anything deserving of kindness and thanks. For neither can Judas be thought worthy by his perfidy and treachery wherewith he wickedly dealt concerning the Savior, as though he had been the cause of such great advantages, that through him the world and the people of the Gentiles were delivered by the Lord's passion. But let these things which were done by Stephen be passed by for the present, lest, while we remember his audacity and pride, we bring a more lasting sadness on ourselves from the things that he has wickedly done. And knowing concerning you that you have settled this matter concerning which there is now a question according to the rule of the truth and the wisdom of Christ, we have exalted with great joy and have given God thanks that we have found in brethren placed at such a distance, such a unanimity of faith and truth with us. For the grace of God is mighty to associate and join together in the bond of charity and unity even those things which seem to be divided by a considerable space of earth, according to the way in which of old 
Also, the divine power associated in the bond of unanimity, Ezekiel and Daniel, though later in their age and separated from them by a long space of time, to Job and Noah, who were among the first, so that although they were separated by long periods, yet by divine inspiration they felt the same truths. And this also we now observe in you, that you, who are separated from us by the most extensive regions, approve yourselves to be, nevertheless, joined with us in mind and spirit, all which arises from the divine unity. For even as the Lord who dwells in us is one and the same, he everywhere joins and couples his own people in the bond of unity, whence their sound has gone out into the whole earth, who are sent by the Lord swiftly running in the spirit of unity. As, on the other hand, it is of no advantage that some are very near and joined together bodily, if in spirit and mind they differ, since souls cannot at all be united which divide themselves from God's unity. For lo, it says, quote, They that are far from thee shall perish. End quote. But such shall undergo the judgment of God according to their desert, as depart from his words, who prays to the Father for unity, and says, quote, Father, grant that, as thou and I are one, so they also may be one in us. End quote. But we receive those things which you have written as if they were our own, nor do we read them cursorily, but by frequent repetition have committed them to memory. Nor does it hinder saving usefulness, either to repeat the same things for the confirmation of the truth, or, moreover, to add some things for the sake of accumulating proof. But if anything has been added by us, it is not added as if there had been too little said by you. But since the divine discourse surpasses human nature, and the soul cannot conceive or grasp the whole and perfect word, therefore also the number of prophets is so great that the divine wisdom in its multiplicity may be distributed through many. Whence also he who first speaks in prophecy is bidden to be silent if a revelation be made to a second. For which reason it happens of necessity among us that year by year we, the elders and prelates, assemble together to arrange those matters which are committed to our care, so that, if any things are more serious, they may be directed by the common council. Moreover, that some remedy may be sought for by repentance for lapsed brethren, and for those wounded by the devil after the saving laver, not as though they obtained remission of sins from us, but that by our means they may be converted to the understanding of their sins, and may be compelled to give fuller satisfaction to the Lord. But since that messenger sent by you was in haste to return to you, and the winter season was pressing, we replied what we could to your letter. And indeed, as respects what Stephen has said, as though the apostles forbade those who come from heresy to be baptized, and delivered this also to be observed by their successors, you have replied most abundantly that no one is so foolish as to believe that the apostles delivered this, when it is even well known that these heresies themselves, execrable and detestable as they are, arose subsequently when even Marcion, the disciple of Serdo, is found to have introduced his sacrilegious tradition against God long after the apostles, and after long lapse of time from them, Apelles, also consenting to his blasphemy, added many other new and more important matters hostile to faith and truth. But also the time of Valentinus and Basilides is manifest, that they too, after the apostles, and after a long period, rebelled against the church of God with their wicked lies. It is plain 
that the other heretics also afterwards introduced their evil sects and perverse inventions, even as every one was led by error, all of whom, it is evident, were self-condemned and have declared against themselves an inevitable sentence before the day of judgment. And he who confirms the baptism of these, what else does he do but to judge himself with them and condemn himself, making himself a partaker with such? But that they who are at Rome do not observe those things in all cases which are handed down from the beginning, and vainly pretend the authority of the apostles, any one may know also from the fact that concerning the celebration of Easter, and concerning many other sacraments of divine matters, he may see that there are some diversities among them, and that all things are not observed among them alike, which are observed at Jerusalem, just as in very many other provinces also many things are varied because of the difference of the places and names. And yet on this account there is no departure at all from the peace and unity of the Catholic Church, such as Stephen has now dared to make, breaking the peace against you, which his predecessors have always kept with you in mutual love and honor, even herein defaming Peter and Paul, the blessed apostles, as if the very men delivered this who in their epistles execrated heretics and warned us to avoid them. Whence it appears that this tradition is of men which maintains heretics and asserts that they have baptism which belongs to the church alone. But, moreover, you have well answered that part where Stephen said in his letter that heretics themselves also are of one mind in respect of baptism, and that they do not baptize such as come to them from one another, but only communicate with them, as if we also ought to do this. In which place, although you have already proved that it is sufficiently ridiculous for any one to follow those that are in error, yet we add this moreover, over and above, that it is not wonderful for heretics to act thus, who, although in some lesser matters they differ, yet in that which is greatest they hold one and the same agreement to blaspheme the Creator, figuring for themselves certain dreams and phantasms of an unknown God. Assuredly, it is but natural that these should agree in having a baptism which is unreal, in the same way as they agree in repudiating the truth of the divinity, of whom, since it is tedious to reply to their several statements, either wicked or foolish, it is sufficient shortly to say in some that they who do not hold the true Lord the Father cannot hold the truth either of the Son or of the Holy Spirit according to which also they who are called cataphrygians and endeavor to claim to themselves new prophecies, can have neither the Father, nor the Son, nor the Holy Spirit, of whom, if we ask what Christ they announce, they will reply that they preach him who sent the Spirit that speaks by Montanus and Prisca. And in these, when we observe that there has been not the Spirit of Truth, but of error, we know that they who maintain their false prophesying against the faith of Christ cannot have Christ. Moreover, all other heretics, if they have separated themselves from the church of God, can have nothing of power or of grace, since all power and grace are established in the church where the elders preside, who possess the power both of baptizing and of imposition of hands, and of ordaining. For as a heretic may not lawfully ordain, nor lay on hands, so neither may he baptize, nor do anything holily or spiritually, since he is an alien from spiritual and deifying sanctity. All which we sometime back confirmed in Iconium, which is a place in Phrygia, when we were assembled together with those who had gathered from Galatia and Cilicia and other neighboring countries as to be held and firmly vindicated against heretics, 
when there was some doubt in certain minds concerning that matter. And as Stephen and those who agree with him contend that putting away of sins and second birth may result from the baptism of heretics, among whom they themselves confess that the Holy Spirit is not, let them consider and understand that spiritual birth cannot be without the Spirit, in conformity with which also the blessed Apostle Paul baptized anew with the spiritual baptism those who had already been baptized by John before the Holy Spirit had been sent by the Lord, and so laid hands on them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. But what kind of a thing is it that when we see that Paul, after John's baptism, baptized his disciples again, we are hesitating to baptize those who come to the church from heresy after their unhallowed and profane dipping, unless, perchance, Paul was inferior to the bishops of these times, so that these, indeed, can by imposition of hands alone give the Holy Spirit to those heretics who come to the church, while Paul was not fitted to give the Holy Spirit by imposition of hands to those who had been baptized by John, unless he had first baptized them also with the baptism of the church. That, moreover, is absurd, that they do not think it is to be required who was the person that baptized, for the reason that he who has been baptized may have obtained grace by the invocation of the Trinity, of the names of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Then this will be the wisdom which Paul writes is in those who are perfected. But who in the church is perfect and wise, who can either defend or believe this, that this bare invocation of names is sufficient to the remission of sins and the sanctification of baptism, since these things are only then of advantage when both he who baptizes has the Holy Spirit, and the baptism itself also is not ordained without the Spirit. But, say they, he who, in any manner whatever, is baptized without, may obtain the grace of baptism by his disposition and faith, which doubtless is ridiculous in itself, as if either a wicked disposition could attract to itself from heaven the sanctification of the righteous, or a false faith the truth of believers, but that not all who call on the name of Christ are heard, and that their invocation cannot obtain any grace the Lord himself manifests, saying, quote, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. End quote. Because there is no difference between a false prophet and a heretic. For as the former deceives in the name of God or Christ, so the latter deceives in the sacrament of baptism. Both strive by falsehood to deceive men's wills. But I wish to relate some facts to you concerning a circumstance which occurred among us pertaining to this very matter. About two and twenty years ago, in the times after the Emperor Alexander, there happened in these parts many struggles and difficulties, either in general to all men, or privately to Christians. Moreover, there were many and frequent earthquakes, so that many places were overthrown throughout Cappadocia and Pontus. Even certain cities, dragged into the abyss, were swallowed up by the opening of the gaping earth so that from this also a severe persecution arose against us of the Christian name. And this, after the long peace of the previous age, arose suddenly, and with its unusual evils was made more terrible for the disturbance of our people. Serenianus was then governor in our province, a bitter and terrible persecutor. But the faithful, being set in this state of disturbance, and fleeing hither and thither for fear of persecution, and leaving their country, and passing over into other regions, for there was an opportunity of passing over, for the reason that that persecution was not over the whole world, but was local, there arose among us, on a sudden, a certain woman, who in a state of ecstasy announced herself as a prophetess, and acted as if filled with the Holy Ghost, and she was so moved by the impetus of the principal demons 
that for a long time she made anxious and deceived the brotherhood, accomplishing certain wonderful and portentous things, and promised that she would cause the earth to be shaken. Not that the power of the demon was so great that he could prevail to shake the earth or to disturb the elements, but that sometimes a wicked spirit, prescient and perceiving that there will be an earthquake, pretends that he will do what he sees will happen. By these lies and boastings, he had so subdued the minds of individuals that they obeyed him and followed whithersoever he commanded and led. He would also make that woman walk in the keen winter with bare feet over frozen snow, and not to be troubled or hurt in any degree by that walking. Moreover, she would say that she was hurrying to Judea and to Jerusalem, feigning as if she had come thence. Here also she deceived one of the presbyters, a countryman, and another deacon, so that they had intercourse with that same woman, which was shortly afterwards detected. For on a sudden there appeared unto her one of the exorcists, a man approved, and always of good conversation in respect of religious discipline, who, stimulated by the exhortation also of very many brethren, who were themselves strong and praiseworthy in the faith, raised himself up against that wicked spirit to overcome it, which, moreover, by its subtile fallacy, had predicted this a little while before, that a certain adverse and unbelieving tempter would come. Yet that exorcist, inspired by God's grace, bravely resisted, and showed that that which was before thought holy was indeed a most wicked spirit. But that woman, who previously by wiles and deceitfulness of the demon was attempting many things for the deceiving of the faithful, among other things by which she had deceived many, also had frequently dared this, to pretend with an invocation not to be contemned that she sanctified bread and celebrated the Eucharist, and to offer sacrifice to the Lord, not without the sacrament of the accustomed utterance, and also to baptize many, making use of the usual and lawful words of interrogation, that nothing might seem to be different from the ecclesiastical rule. What, then, shall we say about the baptism of this woman, by which a most wicked demon baptized through means of a woman? Do Stephen, and they who agree with him, approve of this also, especially when neither the symbol of the Trinity nor the legitimate and ecclesiastical interrogatory were wanting to her. Can it be believed that either the remission of sins was given, or the regeneration of the saving laver duly completed, when all things, although after the image of truth, yet were done by a demon? Unless, perchance, they who defend the baptism of heretics contend that the demon also conferred the grace of baptism in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Among them, no doubt, there is the same error. It is the very deceitfulness of devils, since among them the Holy Spirit is not at all. Moreover, what is the meaning of that which Stephen would assert, that the presence and holiness of Christ is with those who are baptized among heretics? For if the apostle does not speak falsely when he says, quote, as many of you as are baptized into Christ have put on Christ, end quote. Certainly, he who has been baptized among them into Christ has put on Christ. But if he has put on Christ, he might also receive the Holy Ghost, who was sent by Christ, and hands are vainly laid upon him who comes to us for the reception of the Spirit. Unless, perhaps, he has not put on the spirit from Christ, so that Christ indeed may be with heretics, but the Holy Spirit not be with them. But let us briefly run through the other matters also, which were spoken of by you abundantly and most fully, especially as Rogatianus, our well-beloved deacon, is hurrying to you. For it follows that they must be asked by us when they defend heretics whether their baptism is carnal or spiritual. 
For if it is carnal, they differ in no respect from the baptism of the Jews, which they use in such a manner that in it, as if in a common and vulgar laver, only external filth is washed away. But if it is spiritual, how can baptism be spiritual among those among whom there is no Holy Spirit? And thus, the water wherewith they are washed is to them only a carnal washing, not a sacrament of baptism. But if the baptism of heretics can have the regeneration of the second birth, those who are baptized among them must be counted not heretics, but children of God. For the second birth, which occurs in baptism, begets sons of God. But if the spouse of Christ is one, which is the Catholic Church, it is she herself who alone bears sons of God. For there are not many spouses of Christ, since the Apostle says, quote, I have espoused you, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And, hearken, O daughter, and consider, and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people, for the king hath greatly desired thy beauty. And, come with me, my spouse, from Lebanon. Thou shalt come, and shalt pass over from the source of thy faith. And, I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. End quote. We see that one person is everywhere set forward, because also the spouse is one. But the synagogue of heretics is not one with us, because the spouse is not an adulteress and a harlot. Whence also she cannot bear children of God, unless, as appears to Stephen, heresy indeed brings them forth and exposes them, while the church takes them up when exposed and nourishes those for her own whom she has not born, although she cannot be the mother of strange children. And therefore, Christ our Lord, setting forth that his spouse is one, and declaring the sacrament of his unity, says, quote, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. End quote. For if Christ is with us, but the heretics are not with us, certainly the heretics are in opposition to Christ. And if we gather with Christ, but the heretics do not gather with us, doubtless, they scatter. But neither must we pass over what has been necessarily remarked by you, that the church, according to the Song of Songs, is a garden enclosed and a fountain sealed, a paradise with the fruit of apples. They who have never entered into this garden, and have not seen the paradise planted by God the Creator, how shall they be able to afford to another the living water of the saving laver from the fountain which is enclosed within and sealed with a divine seal? And as the ark of Noah was nothing else than the sacrament of the church of Christ, which then, when all without were perishing, kept those only safe who were within the ark, we are manifestly instructed to look to the unity of the church." even as also the Apostle Peter laid down, saying, quote, Thus also shall baptism in like manner make you safe, end quote, showing that as they who were not in the ark with Noah not only were not purged and saved by water, but at once perished in that deluge, so now also whoever are not in the church with Christ will perish outside, unless they are converted by penitence to the only and saving laver of the church. But what is the greatness of his error, and what the depth of his blindness, who says that remission of sins can be granted in the synagogues of heretics, and does not abide on the foundation of the one church, which was once based by Christ upon the rock, may be perceived from this, that Christ said to Peter alone, quote, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. End quote. And again, in the gospel, when Christ breathed on the apostles alone, saying, quote, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. End quote. Therefore, the power of remitting sins was given to the apostles and to the churches which they, sent by Christ, established, 
and to the bishops who succeeded to them by vicarious ordination. But the enemies of the one Catholic Church in which we are, and the adversaries of us who have succeeded the apostles, asserting for themselves in opposition to us unlawful priesthoods and setting up profane altars, what else are they than Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, profane with a like wickedness, and about to suffer the same punishments which they did, as well as those who agree with them, just as their partners and abettors perished with a like death to theirs. And in this respect, I am justly indignant at this so open and manifest folly of Stephen, that he who so boasts of the place of his episcopate, and contends that he holds the succession from Peter, on whom the foundations of the church were laid, should introduce many other rocks and establish new buildings of many churches, maintaining that there is baptism in them by his authority. For they who are baptized doubtless fill up the number of the church, but he who approves their baptism maintains of those baptized that the church is also with them. Nor does he understand that the truth of the Christian rock is overshadowed and in some measure abolished by him when he thus betrays and deserts unity. The apostle acknowledges that the Jews, although blinded by ignorance and bound by the grossest wickedness, have yet a zeal for God. Stephen, who announces that he holds by succession the throne of Peter, is stirred with no zeal against heretics when he concedes to them not a moderate but the very greatest power of grace, so far as to say and assert that, by the sacrament of baptism, the filth of the old man is washed away by them, that they pardon the former mortal sins, that they make sons of God by heavenly regeneration, and renew to eternal life by the sanctification of the divine laver. He who concedes and gives up to heretics in this way the great and heavenly gifts of the church, what else does he do but communicate with them for whom he maintains and claims so much grace? And now he hesitates in vain to consent to them, and to be a partaker with them in other matters also, to meet together with them, and equally with them to mingle their prayers and appoint a common altar and sacrifice. But, says he, the name of Christ is of great advantage to faith and the sanctification of baptism, so that whosoever is anywhere soever baptized in the name of Christ immediately obtains the grace of Christ. Although this position may be briefly met and answered, that if baptism without in the name of Christ availed for the cleansing of man, in the name of the same Christ, the imposition of hands might avail also for the reception of the Holy Spirit. And the other things also which are done among heretics will begin to seem just and lawful when they are done in the name of Christ, as you have maintained in your letter that the name of Christ could be of no avail except in the church alone, to which alone Christ has conceded the power of heavenly grace." But with respect to the refutation of the custom which they seem to oppose to the truth, who is so foolish as to prefer custom to truth, or when he sees the light not to forsake the darkness? Unless most ancient customs in any respect avail the Jews upon the advent of Christ, that is, the truth, in remaining in their old usage and forsaking the new way of truth. And this indeed you Africans are able to say against Stephen, that when you knew the truth you forsook the error of custom. But we join custom to truth, and to the Romans' custom we oppose custom, but the custom of truth, holding from the beginning that which was delivered by Christ and the apostles. Nor do we remember that this at any time began among us, since it has always been observed here that we knew none but one church of God, and accounted no baptism holy except that of the holy church. Certainly, since some doubted about the baptism of those who, although they received the new prophets, yet appear to recognize the same Father and Son with us, very many of us meeting together in Iconium very carefully examined the matter, and we decided 
that every baptism was altogether to be rejected, which is arranged for without the church. But to what they allege and say on behalf of the heretics that the apostles said, quote, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, end quote, it is idle for us to reply when it is manifest that the apostle in his epistle wherein he said this, made mention neither of heretics nor of baptism of heretics, but spoke of brethren only, whether as perfidiously speaking in agreement with himself, or as persevering in sincere faith, nor is it needful to discuss this in a long argument, but it is sufficient to read the epistle itself, and to gather from the apostle himself what the apostle said. What then, say they, will become of those coming from the heretics, have been received without the baptism of the church. If they have departed this life, they are reckoned in the number of those who have been catechumens indeed among us, but have died before they were baptized. No trifling advantage of truth and faith, to which they had attained by forsaking error, although, being prevented by death, they had not gained the consummation of grace." But they who still abide in life should be baptized with the baptism of the church, that they may obtain remission of sins, lest, by presumption of others, they remain in their old error and die without the completion of grace. But what a crime is theirs on the one hand who receive, or on the other, theirs who are received, that their foulness not being washed away by the laver of the church, nor their sins put away, communion being rashly seized, they touch the body and blood of the Lord, although it is written, quote, Whosoever shall eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. End quote. We have judged that those also whom they, who had formerly been bishops in the Catholic Church, and afterwards had assumed to themselves the power of clerical ordination, had baptized, are to be regarded as not baptized. And this is observed among us, that whosoever dipped by them come to us are baptized among us as strangers, and having obtained nothing with the only and true baptism of the Catholic Church, and obtained the regeneration of the laver of life. And yet... There is a great difference between him who unwillingly and constrained by the necessity of persecution has given way and him who with a profane will boldly rebels against the church or with impious voice blasphemes against the Father and God of Christ and the creator of the whole world. And Stephen is not ashamed to assert and to say that remission of sins can be granted by those who are themselves set fast in all kinds of sins, as if in the house of death there could be the laver of salvation. What, then, is to be made of what is written? Quote, Abstain from strange water, and drink not from a strange fountain. End quote. If, leaving the sealed fountain of the church, you take up strange water for your own, and pollute the church with unhallowed fountains. For, when you communicate with the baptism of heretics, what else do you do than drink from their slow and mud, and while you yourself are purged with the church's sanctification, you become befouled with the contact of the filth of others? And do you not fear the judgment of God when you are giving testimony to heretics in opposition to the church, although it is written, quote, A false witness shall not be unpunished. End quote. But indeed, you are worse than all heretics. For when many, as soon as their error is known, come over to you from them, that they may receive the true light of the church, you assist the errors of those who come, and obscuring the light of ecclesiastical truth, you heap up the darkness of the heretical night. And although they confess that they are in sins, and have no grace, and therefore come to the church, you take away from them the remission of sins, which is given in baptism, by saying that they are already baptized and have obtained the grace of the church outside the church. And you do not perceive that their souls will be required at your hands when the day of judgment shall come. 
for having denied to the thirsting the drink of the church and having been the occasion of death to those that were desirous of living. And after all this, you are indignant. Consider with what want of judgment you dare to blame those who strive for the truth against falsehood. For who ought more justly to be indignant against the other, whether he who supports God's enemies, or he who, in opposition to him who supports God's enemies, unites with us on behalf of the truth of the church, except that it is plain that the ignorant are also excited and angry, because by the want of counsel and discourse they are easily turned to wrath so that, of none more than of you, does divine scripture say, quote, A wrathful man stirreth up strifes, and a furious man heapeth up sins. End quote. For what strifes and dissensions have you stirred up throughout the churches of the whole world? Moreover, how great sin have you heaped up for yourself, when you cut yourself off from so many flocks? For it is yourself that you have cut off. Do not deceive yourself, since he is really the schismatic who has made himself an apostate from the communion of ecclesiastical unity. For while you think that all may be excommunicated by you, you have excommunicated yourself alone from all, and not even the precepts of an apostle have been able to mold you to the rule of truth and peace, although he warned and said, quote, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in us all. End quote. How carefully has Stephen fulfilled these salutary commands and warnings of the apostle, keeping in the first place lowliness of mind and meekness? For what is more lowly or meek than to have disagreed with so many bishops throughout the whole world, breaking peace with each one of them in various kinds of discord? At one time, with the Eastern churches, as we are sure you know, at another time, with you, who are in the South, from whom he received bishops as messengers sufficiently, patiently, and meekly, not to receive them even to the speech of an ordinary conference, and even more, so mindful of love and charity as to command the entire fraternity that no one should receive them into his house, so that not only peace and communion, but also a shelter and entertainment were denied to them when they came. This is to have kept the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, to cut himself off from the unity of love, and to make himself a stranger in all respects from his brethren, and to rebel against the sacrament and the faith with the madness of contumacious discord. With such a man can there be one spirit and one body, in whom perchance there is not even one mind, so slippery and shifting and uncertain is it. But as far as he is concerned, let us leave him. Let us rather deal with that concerning which there is the greatest question. They who contend that persons baptized among the heretics ought to be received as if they had obtained the grace of lawful baptism, say that baptism is one and the same to them and to us, and differs in no respect. But what says the Apostle Paul? Quote, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. End quote. If the baptism of heretics be one and the same with ours, without doubt, their faith also is one. But if our faith is one, assuredly also we have one Lord. If there is one Lord, it follows that we say that he is one. But if this unity, which cannot be separated and divided at all, is itself also among heretics, why do we contend any more? Why do we call them heretics and not Christians? Moreover, since we and heretics have not one God, nor one Lord, nor one church, nor one faith, 
nor even one spirit, nor one body, it is manifest that neither can baptism be common to us with heretics, since between us there is nothing at all in common. And yet, Stephen is not ashamed to afford patronage to such an opposition to the church, and for the sake of maintaining heretics to divide the brotherhood, and in addition to call Cyprian a false Christ, and a false apostle, and a deceitful worker, and he, conscious that all these characters are in himself, has been in advance of you by falsely objecting to another those things which he himself ought deservedly to hear. We all bid you, for all our sakes, with all the bishops who are in Africa, and all the clergy, and all the brotherhood, farewell, that, constantly of one mind, and thinking the same thing, we may find you united with us, even though afar off. Epistle 75 to Magnus on baptizing the Novatians and those who obtain grace on a sickbed. Argument. The former part of this letter is of the same tenor with those that precede, except that he inculcates concerning the Novatians what he had in substance said concerning all heretics. Moreover, insinuating, by the way, that the legitimate succession in the See of Peter is known as the Church may be known. In the second part, which hitherto, as the title sufficiently indicates, has been wrongly published as a separate letter, he teaches that that is a true baptism wherein one is baptized by sprinkling on a sickbed as well as by immersion in the Church. Cyprian, to Magnus his son, greeting. With your usual religious diligence, you have consulted my poor intelligence, dear son, as to whether, among other heretics, they also who come from Novatian ought, after his profane washing, to be baptized and sanctified in the Catholic Church with the lawful and true and only baptism of the Church. Respecting which matter, as much as the capacity of my faith and the sanctity and truth of the divine scriptures suggest, I answer that no heretics and schismatics at all have any power or right, for which reason Novatian neither ought to be nor can be accepted, inasmuch as he also is without the church and acting in opposition to the peace and love of Christ from being counted among adversaries and antichrists. For our Lord Jesus Christ, when he testified in his gospel that those who were not with him were his adversaries, did not point out any species of heresy, but showed that all whatsoever who were not with him, and who, not gathering with him, were scattering his flock, were his adversaries, saying, quote, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth, end quote. Moreover, the blessed Apostle John himself distinguished no heresy or schism, neither did he set down any as specially separated, but he called all who had gone out from the church, and who acted in opposition to the church, Antichrists, saying, quote, Ye have heard that Antichrist cometh, and even now are come many Antichrists. Wherefore, we know that this is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us." End quote. Whence it appears that all are adversaries of the Lord and Antichrist who are known to have departed from charity and from the unity of the Catholic Church. In addition, moreover, the Lord establishes it in his gospel and says, quote, But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. End quote. Now if they who despise the church are counted heathens and publicans, much more certainly is it necessary that rebels and enemies who forge false altars and lawless priesthood and sacrilegious sacrifices and corrupted names should be counted among heathens and publicans, since they who sin less and are only despisers of the church are by the Lord's sentence judged to be heathens and publicans. But that the church is one, the Holy Spirit declares in the Song of Songs, saying in the person of Christ, quote, My dove, my undefiled, is one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. End quote. Concerning which also, he says again, quote, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring sealed up, a well of living water. End quote. But if the spouse of Christ, which is the church, is a garden enclosed, a thing that is closed up cannot lie open to strangers and profane persons. 
And if it is a fountain sealed, he who, being placed without, has no access to the spring, can neither drink thence nor be sealed. And the well also of living water, if it is one and the same within, he who is placed without cannot be quickened and sanctified from that water, of which it is only granted to those who are within to make any use or to drink. Peter also, showing this, set forth that the church is one, and that only they who are in the church can be baptized, and said, quote, In the ark of Noah, few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism shall save you, end quote. Proving and attesting that the one ark of Noah was a type of the one church. If, then, in that baptism of the world, thus expiated and purified, he who was not in the ark of Noah could be saved by water, he who is not in the church to which alone baptism is granted can also now be quickened by baptism. Moreover, too, the Apostle Paul, more openly and clearly still manifesting the same thing, writes to the Ephesians and says, quote, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water, end quote. But if the church is one, which is loved by Christ, and is alone cleansed by his washing, how can he who is not in the church be either loved by Christ or washed and cleansed by his washing? Wherefore, since the church alone has the living water and the power of baptizing and cleansing man, he who says that any one can be baptized and sanctified by Novatian must first show and teach that Novatian is in the church or presides over the church. For the church is one, and as she is one, cannot be both within and without. For if she is with Novatian, she was not with Cornelius. But if she was with Cornelius, who succeeded the bishop Fabian by lawful ordination, and whom, beside the honor of the priesthood, the Lord glorified also with martyrdom, Novatian is not in the church, nor can he be reckoned as a bishop, who, succeeding to no one, and despising the evangelical and apostolic tradition, sprang from himself. For he who has not been ordained in the church can neither have nor hold to the church in any way. For the faith of the sacred scripture sets forth that the church is not without, nor can be separated nor divided against itself, but maintains the unity of an inseparable and undivided house since it is written of the sacrament of the Passover and of the Lamb, which Lamb designated Christ, quote, In one house shall it be eaten, you shall not carry forth the flesh abroad out of the house, end quote. Which also we see expressed concerning Rahab, who herself also bore a type of the church, who received the command which said, quote, Thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household unto thee into thine house, and whosoever shall go out of the doors of thine house into the street, his blood shall be upon him. End quote. In which mystery is declared that they who will live and escape from the destruction of the world must be gathered together into one house alone, that is, into the church, but whosoever of those thus collected together shall go out abroad, that is, if any one, although he may have obtained grace in the church, shall depart and go out of the church, that his blood shall be upon him, that is, that he himself must charge it upon himself that he perishes, which the Apostle Paul explains, teaching and enjoining that a heretic must be avoided as perverse and a sinner and as condemned of himself. For that man will be guilty of his own ruin, who, not being cast out by the bishop, but of his own accord, deserting from the church, is by heretical presumption condemned of himself. And therefore the Lord, suggesting to us a unity that comes from divine authority, lays it down, saying, quote, I and my Father are one, end quote. To which unity, reducing his church, he says again, quote, And there shall be one flock and one shepherd, end quote. But if the flock is one, how can he be numbered among the flock who is not in the number of the flock? Or how can he be esteemed a pastor who, while the true shepherd remains and presides over the church of God by successive ordination, succeeding to no one and beginning from himself, becomes a stranger and a profane person, an enemy of the Lord's peace and of the divine unity, not dwelling in the house of God, that is, in the church of God, in which none dwell except they are of one heart and one mind, since the Holy Spirit speaks in the Psalms and says, quote, it is God who maketh men to dwell of one mind in a house.
end quote. Besides, even the Lord's sacrifices themselves declare that Christian unanimity is linked together with itself by a firm and inseparable charity. For when the Lord calls bread, which is combined by the union of many grains, his body, he indicates our people whom he bore as being united, and when he calls the wine, which is pressed from many grapes and clusters and collected together, his blood, he also signifies our flock linked together by the mingling of a united multitude. If Novatian is united to this bread of the Lord, if he also is mingled with this cup of Christ, he may also seem to be able to have the grace of the one baptism of the church, if it be manifest that he holds the unity of the church. In fine, how inseparable is the sacrament of unity, and how hopeless are they, and what excessive ruin they earn for themselves from the indignation of God, who make a schism, and forsaking their bishop, appoint another false bishop for themselves without. Holy Scripture declares in the book of Kings, where ten tribes were divided from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, and forsaking their king, appointed for themselves another one without. It says, quote, and the Lord was very angry with all the seed of Israel, and removed them away, and delivered them into the hand of spoilers, until he cast them out of his sight. For Israel was scattered from the house of David, and they made themselves a king, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. End quote. It says that the Lord was very angry, and gave them up to perdition, because they were scattered from unity, and had made another king for themselves. And so great was the indignation of the Lord against those who had made the schism, that even when the man of God was sent to Jeroboam to charge upon him his sins and predict the future vengeance, he was forbidden to eat bread or to drink water with them. And when he did not observe this and took meat against the command of God, he was immediately smitten by the majesty of the divine judgment, so that returning thence he was slain on the way by the jaws of a lion which attacked him. And dares any one to say that the saving water of baptism and heavenly grace can be in common with schismatics, with whom neither earthly food nor worldly drink ought to be in common? Moreover, the Lord satisfies us in his gospel, and shows forth a still greater light of intelligence, that the same persons who had then divided themselves from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, and forsaking Jerusalem, had seceded to Samaria, should be reckoned among profane persons and Gentiles. For when first he sent his disciples on the ministry of salvation, he bade them, saying, quote, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. End quote. Sending first to the Jews, he commands the Gentiles as yet to be passed over, but by adding that even the city of the Samaritans was to be omitted, where there were schismatics, he shows that schismatics were to be put on the same level as Gentiles. But if anyone objects by way of saying that Novatian holds the same law which the Catholic Church holds, baptizes with the same symbol with which we baptize, knows the same God and Father, the same Christ, the Son, the same Holy Spirit, and that for this reason he may claim the power of baptizing, namely, that he seems not to differ from us in the baptismal interrogatory, let any one that thinks that this may be objected know first of all that there is not one law of the creed, nor the same interrogatory common to us and to schismatics. For when they say, quote, Dost thou believe the remission of sins and life eternal through the Holy Church? End quote. They lie in their interrogatory, since they have not the Church. Then, besides, with their own voice, they themselves confess that remission of sins cannot be given except by the Holy Church, and not having this, they show that sins cannot be remitted among them. But that they are said to have the same God the Father as we, to know the same Christ the Son, the same Holy Spirit, can be of no avail to such as these. For even Korah, Dathan, and Abiram knew the same God as did the priest Aaron and Moses. Living under the same law and religion, they invoked the one and true God who was to be invoked and worshipped. Yet, because they transgressed the ministry of their office in opposition to Aaron the priest, who had received the legitimate priesthood by the condensation of God and the ordination of the Lord, and claimed to themselves the power of sacrificing, divinely stricken, they immediately suffered punishment for their unlawful endeavors, and sacrifices offered irreligiously and lawlessly, contrary to the right of divine appointment, could not be accepted, nor profit them." 
even those very censers in which incense had been lawlessly offered, lest they should any more be used by the priests, but that they might rather exhibit a memorial of the divine vengeance and indignation for the correction of their successors, being by the command of the Lord melted and purged by fire, were beaten out into flexible plates and fastened to the altars according to what the Holy Scripture says, quote, to be, it says, a memorial to the children of Israel, that no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he be not as Korah, end quote. And yet those men had not made a schism, nor had gone out abroad, and in opposition to God's priests, rebelled shamelessly, and with hostility. But this these men are now doing, who divide the church, and, as rebels against the peace and unity of Christ, attempt to establish a throne for themselves, and to assume the primacy, and to claim the right of baptizing and of offering. How can they complete what they do, or obtain anything by lawless endeavors from God, seeing that they are endeavoring against God what is not lawful to them? Wherefore, they who patronize Novatian or other schismatics of that kind, contend in vain that any one can be baptized and sanctified with a saving baptism among them, when it is plain that he who baptizes has not the power of baptizing. And, moreover, that it may be better understood what is the divine judgment against audacity of the like kind, we find that in such wickedness, not only the leaders and originators, but also the partakers are destined to punishment, unless they have separated themselves from the communion of the wicked, as the Lord by Moses commands and says, quote, Separate yourselves from the tents of those most hardened men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in their sins. End quote. And what the Lord had threatened by Moses, he fulfilled, that whosoever had not separated himself from Korah and Dathan and Abiram immediately suffered punishment for his impious communion. By which example is shown and proved that all will be liable to guilt as well as its punishment, who with irreligious boldness mingle themselves with schismatics in opposition to prelates and priests, even as also by the prophet Hosea the Holy Spirit witnesses and says, Quote, their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourning, all that eat thereof shall be polluted. End quote. Teaching, doubtless, and showing that all are absolutely joined with the leaders in punishment who have been contaminated by their crime. What, then, can be their deservings in the sight of God on whom the punishments are divinely denounced? Or how can such persons justify and sanctify the baptized who, being enemies of the priests, strive to usurp things foreign and lawless, and by no right conceded to them. And yet we do not wonder that, in accordance with their wickedness, they do contend for them. For it is necessary that each one of them should maintain what they do, nor when vanquished will they easily yield, although they know that what they do is not lawful. That is to be wondered at, Yea, rather to be indignant and aggrieved at, that Christians should support antichrists, and that prevaricators of the faith and betrayers of the church should stand within in the church itself. And these, although otherwise obstinate and unteachable, yet still at least confess this, that all, whether heretics or schismatics, are without the Holy Ghost, and therefore can indeed baptize, but cannot confer the Holy Spirit. And at this very point they are held fast by us, inasmuch as we show that those who have not the Holy Ghost are not able to baptize at all. For since in baptism every one has his own sins remitted, the Lord proves and declares in his gospel that sins can only be put away by those who have the Holy Spirit. For after his resurrection, sending forth his disciples, he speaks to them, and says, quote, As the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and said to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they shall be remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they shall be retained. End quote. In which place he shows that he alone can baptize and give remission of sins who has the Holy Spirit. Moreover, John, who was to baptize Christ our Lord himself, previously received the Holy Ghost while he was yet in his mother's womb, that it might be certain and manifest that none can baptize save those who have the Holy Spirit. 
Therefore, those who patronize heretics or schismatics must answer us whether they have or have not the Holy Ghost. If they have, why are hands imposed on those who are baptized among them when they come to us, that they may receive the Holy Ghost, since he must surely have been received there, where if he was, he could be given? But if heretics and schismatics, baptized without, have not the Holy Spirit, and therefore hands are imposed on them among us, that here may be received what there neither is nor can be given, it is plain also that remission of sins cannot be given by those who, it is certain, have not the Holy Spirit. And therefore, in order that, according to the divine arrangement and the evangelical truth, they may be able to obtain remission of sins, and to be sanctified, and to become temples of God, they must all absolutely be baptized with the baptism of the church who come from adversaries and antichrists to the church of Christ. You have asked also, dearest son, what I thought of those who obtain God's grace in sickness and weakness, whether they are to be accounted legitimate Christians, for that they are not washed, but sprinkled with the saving water. In this point, my diffidence and modesty prejudges none, so as to prevent any from feeling what he thinks right, and from doing what he feels to be right. As far as my poor understanding conceives it, I think that the divine benefits can in no respect be mutilated and weakened, nor can anything less occur in that case, where, with full and entire faith both of the giver and receiver, is accepted what is drawn from the divine gifts. For in the sacrament of salvation the contagion of sins is not in such wise washed away, as the filth of the skin and of the body is washed away in the carnal and ordinary washing, as that there should be need of saltpeter, and other appliances also, and a bath, and a basin, wherewith this vile body may be washed and purified. Otherwise is the breast of the believer washed, otherwise is the mind of man purified by the merit of faith. In the sacraments of salvation, when necessity compels, and God bestows his mercy, the divine methods confer the whole benefit on believers, nor ought it to trouble any one that sick people seem to be sprinkled or refused, when they obtain the Lord's grace, when the Holy Scriptures speaks by the mouth of the prophet Ezekiel, and says, quote, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean, from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit will I put within you. End quote. Also, in Numbers, quote, And the man that shall be unclean, until the evening shall be purified on the third day, and on the seventh day shall be clean. But if he shall not be purified on the third day, on the seventh day he shall not be clean. And that soul shall be cut off from Israel, because the water of sprinkling hath not been sprinkled upon him. End quote. And again, quote, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel, and cleanse them. And thus shalt thou do unto them, to cleanse them, thou shalt sprinkle them with the water of purification. End quote. And again, quote, The water of sprinkling is a purification. End quote. Whence it appears that the sprinkling also of water prevails equally with the washing of salvation, and that when this is done in the church, where the faith both of the receiver and giver is sound, all things hold and may be consummated and perfected by the majesty of the Lord and by the truth of faith. But, moreover, in respect of some calling those who have obtained the peace of Christ by the saving water and by legitimate faith, not Christians, but clinics, I do not find whence they take up this name, unless, perhaps, having read more, and of a more recondite kind, they have taken these clinics from Hippocrates or Serenus. For I, who know of a clinic in the gospel, know that too the paralytic and the infirm man, who lay on his bed during the long course of his life, his infirmity presented no obstacle to his attainment in the fullest degree of heavenly strength. Nor was he only raised from his bed by the divine indulgence, but he also took up his bed itself, and his restored and increased strength. And therefore, as far as it is allowed me by faith to conceive and to think, this is my opinion, that any one should be esteemed a legitimate Christian, who by the law and right of faith shall have obtained the grace of God in the church. 
or if anyone think that those have gained nothing by having only been sprinkled with the saving water, but that they are still empty and void, let them not be deceived, so as if they escape the evil of their sickness, and get well, they to be baptized. But if they cannot be baptized, who have already been sanctified by ecclesiastical baptism, why are they offended in respect of their faith and the mercy of the Lord? Or have they obtained indeed the divine favor, but in a shorter and more limited measure of the divine gift and of the Holy Spirit, so as indeed to be esteemed Christians, but yet not to be counted equal with others? Nay, verily, the Holy Spirit is not given by measure, but is poured out altogether on the believer. For if the day rises alike to all, and if the sun is diffused with like and equal light over all, how much more does Christ, who is the true sun and the true day, bestow in his church the light of eternal life with the like equality? Of which equality we see the sacrament celebrated in Exodus, when the manna flowed down from heaven, and, prefiguring the things to come, showed forth the nourishment of the heavenly bread and the food of the coming Christ. For there, without distinction, either of sex or of age, an omer was collected equally by each one. Whence it appeared that the mercy of Christ and the heavenly grace that would subsequently follow was equally divided among all, without difference of sex, without distinction of years, without accepting of persons, upon all the people of God the gift of spiritual grace was shed. Assuredly, the same spiritual grace which is equally received in baptism by believers is subsequently either increased or diminished in our conversation and conduct, as in the gospel the Lord's seed is equally sown, but, according to the variety of the soil, some is wasted, and some is increased into a large variety of plenty, with an exuberant fruit of either thirty, or sixty, or a hundredfold. But, once more, when each was called to receive a penny, Wherefore should what is distributed equally by God be diminished by human interpretation? But if any one is moved by this, that some of those who are baptized in sickness are still tempted by unclean spirits, let him know that the obstinate wickedness of the devil prevails even up to the saving water, but that in baptism it loses all the poison of his wickedness. An instance of this we see in the king Pharaoh, who, having struggled long and delayed in his perfidy, could resist and prevail until he came to the water, but when he had come thither, he was both conquered and destroyed. And that that sea was a sacrament of baptism, the blessed apostle declares, saying, quote, Brethren, I would not have you ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. End quote. And he added, saying, quote, Now all these things were our examples. End quote. And this also is done in the present day, in that the devil is scourged and burned and tortured by exorcists, by the human voice and by divine power, and although he often says that he is going out and will leave the men of God, yet in that which he says he deceives and puts in practice what was before done by Pharaoh with the same obstinate and fraudulent deceit. When, however, they come to the water of salvation and to the sanctification of baptism, we ought to know and to trust that there the devil is beaten down, and the man dedicated to God is set free by divine mercy. For as scorpions and serpents, which prevail on the dry ground, when cast into water, cannot prevail, nor retain their venom, so also the wicked spirits, which are called scorpions and serpents, and yet are trodden under foot by us, by the power given by the Lord, cannot remain any longer in the body of a man in whom, baptized and sanctified, the Holy Spirit is beginning to dwell. This, finally, in very fact also we experience, that those who are baptized by urgent necessity and sickness, and obtain grace, are free from the unclean spirit wherewith they were previously moved, and live in the church in praise and honor, and day by day make more and more advance in the increase of heavenly grace by the growth of their faith. And, on the other hand, some of those who are baptized in health, if subsequently they begin to sin, are shaken by the return of the unclean spirit, so that it is manifest that the devil is driven out in baptism by the faith of the believer, and returns if the faith afterwards shall fail, unless, indeed, it seems just to some 
that they who, outside the church, among adversaries and antichrists, are polluted with profane water, should be judged to be baptized, while they who are baptized in the church are thought to have attained less of divine mercy and grace. And so great consideration be had for heretics, that they who come from heresy are not interrogated whether they are washed or sprinkled, whether they be clinics or peripatetics, but among us the sound truth of faith is disparaged, and in ecclesiastical baptism its majesty and sanctity suffer derogation. I replied, dearest son, to your letter, so far as my poor ability prevailed, and I have shown, as far as I could, what I think, prescribing to no one, so as to prevent any prelate from determining what he thinks right, as he shall give an account of his own doings to the Lord, according to what the blessed Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Romans writes and says, quote, Every one of us shall give an account for himself. Let us not therefore judge one another. End quote. I bid you, dear son, ever heartily farewell. Epistle 76. Cyprian to Nemesianus and other martyrs in the mines. Argument. He extols with wonderful commendations the martyrs in the mines, opposing in a beautiful antithesis to the torture of each, the consolations of each. We gather that this was written in exile from the words, quote, If the limits of the place appointed me did not restrain me, banished as I am on account of the confession of the name, end quote. Cyprian, to Nemesianus, Felix, Lucius, another Felix, Lydius, Polianus, Victor, Jader, and Davitus, his fellow bishops, also to his fellow presbyters and deacons, and the rest of the brethren in the mines, martyrs of God, the Father Almighty, and of Jesus Christ our Lord, and of God our Preserver, everlasting greeting. Your glory, indeed, would demand, most blessed and beloved brethren, that I myself should come to see and embrace you, if the limits of the place appointed me did not restrain me, banished as I am for the sake of the confession of the name. But in what way I can, I bring myself into your presence, and even though it is not permitted me to come to you in body and in movement, yet in love and in spirit, I come, expressing my mind in my letter, in which mind I joyfully exult in those virtues and praises of yours, counting myself a partaker with you, although not in bodily suffering, yet in community of love. Could I be silent and restrain my voice in stillness, when I am made aware of so many and such glorious things concerning my dearest friends, things with which the divine condensation has honored you, so that part of you have already gone before by the consummation of their martyrdom, to receive from their Lord the crown of their deserts, part still abide in the dungeons of the prison, or in the mines and in chains, exhibiting by the very delays of their punishments, greater examples for the strengthening and arming of the brethren, advancing by the tediousness of their tortures to more ample titles of merit, to receive as many payments in heavenly rewards as days are now counted in their punishments. I do not marvel, most brave and blessed brethren, that these things have happened to you in consideration of the desert of your religion and your faith that the Lord should thus have lifted you to the lofty height of glory by the honor of his glorification, seeing that you have always flourished in his church, guarding the tenor of the faith, keeping firmly the Lord's commands in simplicity, innocence, in charity, concord, modesty, and humility, diligence in administration, watchfulness in helping those that suffer, mercy in cherishing the poor, constancy in defending the truth, judgment in severity of discipline, and that nothing should be wanting to the example of good deeds in you, even now, in the confession of your voice and the suffering of your body, you provoke the minds of your brethren to divine martyrdom, by exhibiting yourselves as leaders of virtue, that while the flock follows its pastors and imitates what it sees to be done by those set over it, it may be crowned with the like merits of obedience by the Lord. But that, being first severely beaten with clubs and ill use, you have begun, by sufferings of that kind, the glorious firstlings of your confession, is not a matter to be execrated by us. 
where a Christian body is not very greatly terrified at clubs, seeing all its hope is in the wood. The servant of Christ acknowledges the sacrament of his salvation, redeemed by wood to eternal life. He is advanced by wood to the crown. But what wonder if, as golden and silver vessels, you have been committed to the mine that is the home of gold and silver, except that now the nature of the mines is changed, and the places which previously had been accustomed to yield gold and silver have begun to receive them. Moreover, they have put fetters on your feet, and have bound your blessed limbs, and the temples of God with disgraceful chains, as if the spirit also could be bound with the body, or your gold could be stained by the contact of iron. To men, who are dedicated to God, and attesting their faith with religious courage, such things are ornaments, not chains, nor do they bind the feet of Christians for infamy, but glorify them for a crown." O feet blessedly bound, which are loosed not by the smith, but by the Lord. O feet blessedly bound, which are guided to paradise in the way of salvation. O feet bound for the present time in the world, that they may be always free with the Lord. O feet lingering for a while among the fetters and crossbars, but to run quickly to Christ on a glorious road. Let cruelty, either envious or malignant, hold you here in its bonds and chains as long as it will. From this earth and from those sufferings you shall speedily come to the kingdom of heaven. The body is not cherished in the minds with couch and cushions, but it is cherished with the refreshment and solace of Christ. The frame wearied with labors lies prostrate on the ground, but it is no penalty to lie down with Christ. Your limbs unbathed are foul and disfigured with filth and dirt, Within, they are spiritually cleansed, although without the flesh is defiled. There the bread is scarce, but man liveth not by bread alone, but by the word of God. Shivering, you want clothing, but he who puts on Christ is both abundantly clothed and adorned. The hair of your half-shorn head seems repulsive, but since Christ is the head of the man, anything whatever must needs become that head which is illustrious on account of Christ's name. All that deformity, detestable, and foul to Gentiles, with what splendor shall it be recompensed? This temporal and brief suffering, how shall it be exchanged for the reward of a bright and eternal honor, when, according to the word of the blessed apostle, quote, The Lord shall change the body of our humiliation, that it may be fashioned like to the body of his brightness. End quote. But there cannot be felt any loss of either religion, or faith, most beloved brethren, in the fact that now there is given no opportunity there to God's priests for offering and celebrating the divine sacrifices. Yea, you celebrate and offer a sacrifice to God, equally precious and glorious, and that will greatly profit you for the retribution of heavenly rewards, since the sacred scripture speaks, saying, quote, The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a contrite and humbled heart, God doth not despise. End quote. You offer this sacrifice to God. You celebrate this sacrifice without intermission, day and night, being made victims to God and exhibiting yourselves as holy and unspotted offerings, as the apostle exhorts and says, quote, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. End quote. For this it is which especially pleases God. It is this wherein our works with greater deserts are successful in earning God's good will. This it is which alone the obedience of our faith and devotion can render to the Lord for his great and saving benefits, as the Holy Spirit declares and witnesses in the Psalms, quote, What shall I render, says he, to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, end quote. Who would not gladly and readily receive the cup of salvation? 
who would not with joy and gladness desire that in which he himself also may render somewhat unto his Lord, who would not bravely and unfalteringly receive a death precious in the sight of the Lord to please his eyes, who, looking down from above upon us who are placed in the conflict for his name, approves the willing, assists the struggling, crowns the conquering with the recompense of patience, goodness, and affection, rewarding in us whatever he himself has bestowed, and honoring what he has accomplished. For that it is his doing that we conquer, and that we attain by the subduing of the adversary to the palm of the greatest contest the Lord declares and teaches in his gospel, saying, quote, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. End quote. And again, quote, Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which your adversaries shall not be able to resist. End quote. Which, indeed, is both the great confidence of believers and the gravest fault of the faithless, that they do not trust him who promises to give his help to those who confess him and do not, on the other hand, fear him who threatens eternal punishment to those who deny him. All which things, most brave and faithful soldiers of Christ, you have suggested to your brethren, fulfilling in deeds what ye have previously taught in words, hereafter to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, as the Lord promises, and says, quote, Whosoever shall do and teach so shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. End quote. Moreover, a manifold portion of the people, following your example, have confessed alike with you, and alike have been crowned, associated with you in the bond of the strongest charity, and separated from their prelates, neither by the prison nor by the mines, in the number of whom neither are there wanting virgins, in whom the hundredfold are added to the fruit of sixtyfold, and whom a double glory has advanced to the heavenly crown. In boys, also, a courage greater than their age has surpassed their years, in the praise of their confession, so that every sex and every age should adorn the blessed flock of your martyrdom. What now must be the vigor, beloved brethren, of your victorious consciousness? What the loftiness of your mind, what exaltation in feeling, what triumph in your breast, that every one of you stands near to the promised reward of God, are secure from the judgment of God. Walk in the minds with the body captive indeed, but with the heart reigning, that you know Christ is present with you, rejoicing in the endurance of his servants, who are ascending by his footsteps and in his paths to the eternal kingdoms. You daily expect with joy the saving day of your departure, and already about to withdraw from the world, you are hastening to the rewards of martyrdom and to the divine homes to behold after this darkness of the world the purest light, and to receive a glory greater than all sufferings and conflicts, as the apostle witnesses and says, quote, The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us, end quote. And because... Now your word is more effectual in prayers, and supplication is more quick to obtain what is sought for in afflictions. Seek more eagerly, and ask that the divine condensation would consummate the confession of all of us, that from this darkness and these snares of the world, God would set us also free with you, sound and glorious, that we who here are united in the bond of charity and peace, and have stood together against the wrongs of heretics and the oppressions of the heathens, may rejoice together in the heavenly kingdom. I bid you, most blessed and most beloved brethren, ever farewell in the Lord, and always and everywhere remember me. Epistle 77, the reply of Nemesianus, Dativus, Felix, and Victor to Cyprian. Argument. This epistle and the two following ones contain nothing else than replies to the foregoing, inasmuch as they contain the thanksgiving as well for the comfort conveyed by the letter as for the assistance sent therewith. 
but from the fact that three distinct letters are sent in reply to the single one of Cyprian's, we are to gather that the bishops who wrote them were placed in different departments of the minds, and this is confirmed in Epistle 74, where mention is made of one mine in particular. Nemesianus, Dativus, Felix, and Victor, to their brother Cyprian, in the Lord, eternal salvation. You speak, dearly beloved Cyprian, in your letters, always with deep meaning, as suits the condition of the time, by the assiduous reading of which letters both the wicked are corrected, and men of good faith are confirmed. For while you do not cease in your writings to lay bare the hidden mysteries, you thus make us to grow in faith, and men from the world to draw near to belief. For by whatever good things you have introduced in your many books, unconsciously you have described yourself to us. For you are greater than all men in discourse, in speech more eloquent, in counsel wiser, in patience more simple, in works more abundant, in abstinence more holy, in obedience more humble, and in good deeds more innocent. And you yourself know, beloved, that our eager wish was, that we might see you, our teacher and our lover, attain to the crown of a great confession. For as a good and true teacher, that which we your disciples, following you, ought to say before the president, you first in the proceedings before the proconsul have pronounced, and, as a sounding trumpet, you have stirred up God's soldiers, furnished with heavenly arms to the close encounter, and fighting in the first rank, you have slain the devil with a spiritual sword. You have also ordered the troops of the brethren, on the one hand and on the other, with your words, so that snares were on all sides laid for the enemy, and the severed sinews of the very carcass of the public foe were trodden underfoot. Believe us, dearest, that your innocent spirit is not far from the hundredfold reward, seeing that it has feared neither the first onsets of the world, nor shrunk from going into exile, nor hesitated to leave the city, nor dreaded to dwell in a desert place. And since it furnished many with an example of confession, itself first spoke the martyr witness, for it provoked others to act of martyrdom by its own example, and not only began to be a companion of the martyrs already departing from the world, but also linked a heavenly friendship with those who should be so. Therefore, they who were condemned with us give you before God the greatest thanks, beloved Cyprian, that in your letter you have refreshed their suffering breasts, have healed their limbs wounded with clubs, have loosened their feet bound with fetters, have smoothed the hair of their half-shorn head, have illuminated the darkness of the dungeon, have brought down the mountains of the mine to a smooth surface, have even placed fragrant flowers to their nostrils, and have shut out the foul odor of the smoke. Moreover, your continued gifts and those of our beloved Curinus, which you sent to be distributed by Herennianus, the subdeacon, and Lucian, and Maximus, and Amantius the Acolytes, provided a supply of whatever had been wanting for the necessities of their bodies. Let us, then, be in our prayers, helpers of one another, and let us ask, as you have bidden us, that we may have God and Christ and the angels as supporters in all our actions. We bid you, Lord and brother, ever heartily farewell, and have us in mind. Greet all who are with you. All ours who are with us love you, and greet you, and desire to see you. Epistle 78, the reply to the same of Lucius and the rest of the martyrs. Argument. The argument of the present letter is, in substance, the same as that of the preceding, and therefore it is not a letter of Lucius the Roman pontiff, but of Lucius the martyr and the African bishop. To Cyprian, our brother and colleague, Lucius, and all the brethren who are with me in the Lord, greeting. Your letter came to us, dearest brother, while we were exalting and rejoicing in God that he had armed us for the struggle and had made us, by his condensation, conquerors in the battle. The letter, namely, which you sent to us by Heranianus, the subdeacon, and Lucian, 
and Maximus and Mantius, the Acolytes, which when we read, we received a relaxation in our bonds, a solace in our affliction, and a support in our necessity. And we were aroused and more strenuously animated to bear whatever more of punishment might be awaiting us. For before our suffering, we were called forth by you to glory, who first afforded us guidance to confession of the name of Christ. We indeed, who follow the footsteps of your confession, hope for an equal grace with you. For he who is first in the race is first also for the reward. And you, who first occupied the course thence, have communicated this to us from what you began, showing doubtless the undivided love wherewith you have always loved us, so that we, who had one spirit in the bond of peace, might have the grace of your prayers and one crown of confession. But in your case, dearest brother, to the crown of confession is added the reward of your labors, an abundant measure which you shall receive from the Lord in the day of retribution, who have by your letter presented yourself to us, as you manifested to us that candid and blessed breast of yours which we have ever known, and in accordance with its largeness have uttered praises to God with us, not as much as we deserve to hear, but as much as you are able to utter. For with your words you have both adorned those things which had been less instructed in us, and have strengthened us to the sustaining of those sufferings which we bear, as being certain of the heavenly rewards, and of the crown of martyrdom, and of the kingdom of God, from the prophecy which, being filled with the Holy Spirit, you have pledged to us in your letter. All this will happen, beloved, if you will have us in mind in your prayers, which I trust you do, even as we certainly do. And thus, O brother, most longed for, we have received what you sent to us from Quirinius and from yourself, a sacrifice from every clean thing, even as Noah offered to God, and God was pleased with the sweet savour, and had respect unto his offering, so also may he have respect unto yours, and may he be pleased to return to you the reward of this so good work. But I beg that you will command the letter which we have written to Guineris to be sent forward. I bid you, dearest brother, and earnestly desired, ever heartily farewell, and remember us. Greet all who are with you. Farewell. Epistle 79. The Answer of Felix Jader, Polyanus, and the rest of the martyrs, to Cyprian. Argument. The martyrs, above, spoken of, acknowledge with gratitude the assistance sent to them by Cyprian. To our dearest and best beloved Cyprian, Felix, Jader, and Polyanus, together with the presbyters, and all who are abiding with us at the mine of Segua, eternal health in the Lord, we reply to your salutation, dearest brother, by Herennianus, the subdeacon, Lucian, and Maximus, our brethren, strong and safe by the aid of your prayers, from whom we have received a sum under the name of an offering, together with your letter, which you wrote, and in which you have condescended to comfort us as if we were sons, out of the heavenly words, and we have given and do give thanks to God the Father Almighty through his Christ, that we have been thus comforted and strengthened by your address, asking from the candor of your mind that you would deign to have us in your mind in your constant prayers, that the Lord would supply what is wanting in your confession and ours, which he has condescended to confer on us. Greet all who abide with you. We bid you, dearest brother, ever heartily farewell in God. I, Felix, wrote this. I, Jader, subscribed it. I, Polyanus, read it. I greet my lord, Eutychianus. Epistle 80. Cyprian to Sergius, Rogatianus, and the other confessors in prison. Argument. He consoles Rogatianus and his colleagues, the confessors in prison, and gives them courage by the example of the martyrs, Rogatianus, the elder, and Felicimus. The letter itself indicates that it was written in exile. Cyprian, to Sergius and Rogatianus, and the rest of the confessors in the Lord, everlasting health. 
I salute you, dearest and most blessed brethren, myself also desiring to enjoy the sight of you, if the state in which I am placed would permit me to come to you. For what could happen to me more desirable and more joyful than to be now close to you, that you might embrace me with those hands which, pure and innocent, and maintaining the faith of the Lord, have rejected the profane obedience? What more pleasant and sublime than now to kiss your lips, which with a glorious voice have confessed the Lord, to be looked upon even in presence by your eyes, which, despising the world, have become worthy of looking upon God. But since opportunity is not afforded me to share in this joy, I send this letter in my stead to your ears and to your eyes, by which I congratulate and exhort you that you persevere strongly and steadily in the confession of the heavenly glory, and having entered on the way of the Lord's condensation, that you go on in the strength of the Spirit to receive the crown having the Lord as your protector and guide, who said, quote, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. End quote. O blessed prison, which your presence has enlightened! O blessed prison, which sends the men of God to heaven! O darkness, more bright than the sun itself, and clearer than the light of this world, where now are placed temples of God, and your members are to be sanctified by divine confessions. Nor let anything now be revolved in your hearts and minds besides the divine precepts and heavenly commands with which the Holy Spirit has ever animated you to the endurance of suffering. Let no one think of death but of immortality, nor of temporary punishment but of eternal glory, since it is written, quote, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, end quote. And again, quote, a broken spirit is a sacrifice to God, a contrite and humble heart God doth not despise, end quote. And again, where the sacred scripture speaks of the tortures which consecrate God's martyrs and sanctify them in the very trial of suffering, quote, and if they have suffered torments in the sight of men, yet is their hope full of the immortality, and having been a little chastised, they shall be greatly rewarded. For God proved them, and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace hath he tried them, and received them as a sacrifice of burnt offering, and in due time regard shall be had unto them. The righteous shall shine, and shall run to and fro like sparks among stubble. They shall judge the nations, and have dominion over the people, and their Lord shall reign forever." End quote. When, therefore, you reflect that you shall judge and reign with Christ the Lord, you must needs exalt and tread underfoot present sufferings in the joy of what is to come, knowing that from the beginning of the world it has been so appointed that righteousness should suffer there in the conflict of the world, since in the beginning, even at the first, the righteous Abel was slain. And thereafter, all righteous men, and prophets, and apostles who were sent, to all of whom the Lord also in himself has appointed an example, teaching that none shall attain to his kingdom, but those who have followed him in his own way, saying, quote, He that loveth his life in this world shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. End quote. And again, quote, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. End quote. Paul also exhorts us that we who desire to attain to the Lord's promise ought to imitate the Lord in all things. Quote, we are, says he, the sons of God, but if sons, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together." End quote. Moreover, he added the comparison of the present time and of the future glory, saying, quote, The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the coming glory which shall be revealed in us. End quote. Of which brightness, when we consider the glory, it behooves us to bear all afflictions and persecutions, because, Although many are the afflictions of the righteous, yet those are delivered from them all who trust in God. Blessed women also, who are established with you in the same glory of confession, who, maintaining the Lord's faith 
and braver than their sex, not only themselves are near to the crown of glory, but have afforded an example to other women by their constancy. And lest anything should be wanting to the glory of your number, that every sex and age also might be with you in honor, the divine condensation has also associated with you boys in a glorious confession, representing to us something of the same kind as once did Ananias, Azarias, and Misael, the illustrious youths to whom, when shut up in the furnace, the fires gave way and the flames gave refreshment the Lord being present with them, and proving that against his confessors and martyrs the heat of hell could have no power, but that they who trusted in God should always continue unhurt and safe in all dangers. And I beg you to consider more carefully, in accordance with your religion, what must have been the faith in these youths which could deserve such full acknowledgement from the Lord. For, prepared for every fate, as we ought all to be, they say to the king, quote, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter, for our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. End quote. Although they believed, and, in accordance with their faith, knew that they might even be delivered from their present punishment, they still would not boast of this, nor claim it for themselves, saying, quote, But if not, end quote, lest the virtue of their confession should be less without the testimony of their suffering, they added that God could do all things, but yet they would not trust in this, so as to wish to be delivered at the moment, but they thought on that glory of eternal liberty and security. And you also, retaining this faith, and meditating day and night, with your whole heart prepared for God, think of the future only, with contempt for the present, that you may be able to come to the fruit of the eternal kingdom, and to the embrace and kiss and the sight of the Lord, that you may follow in all things Rugatianus, the presbyter, the glorious old man who, to the glory of our time, makes a way for you by his religious courage and divine condensation, who, with Philisimus, our brother, ever quiet and temperate, receiving the attack of a ferocious people, first prepared for you a dwelling in the prison, and, marking out the way for you in some measure, now also goes before you. That this may be consummated in you, we beseech the Lord in constant prayers, that from beginnings going on to the highest results, he may cause those whom he has made to confess also to be crowned. I bid you, dearest and most beloved brethren, ever heartily farewell in the Lord, and may you attain to the crown of heavenly glory. Victor the deacon and those who are with me greet you. Epistle 81 to Secesis on the tidings brought from Rome, telling of the persecution. Argument Cyprian tells the bishop Secesus that in a severe persecution that had been decreed by the emperor Valerian, doubtless with Gallienus, Zixtus the pontiff had suffered at Rome on the 8th of the Ides of August, and he begs him to intimate the same to the rest of his colleagues, that each one might animate his own flock to martyrdom. And as Cyprian suffered shortly after, in the month of September, there is no doubt but that this letter was written near the close of his life. Cyprian, to his brother Secesus, greeting. The reason why I could not write to you immediately, dearest brother, was that all the clergy, being placed in the very heat of the contest, were unable in any way to depart hence. All of them being prepared in accordance with the devotion of their mind for divine and heavenly glory. But know that those have come whom I had sent to the city for this purpose, that they might find out and bring back to us the truth, in whatever manner it had been decreed respecting us. For many various and uncertain things are current in men's opinions, but the truth concerning them is as follows, that Valerian had sent a rescript to the Senate to the effect that bishops and presbyters and deacons should immediately be punished, but that senators and men of importance and Roman knights should lose their dignity and moreover be deprived of their property. And if, 
when their means were taken away, they should persist in being Christians, then they should also lose their heads, but that matrons should be deprived of their property and sent into banishment. Moreover, people of Caesar's household, whoever of them had either confessed before or should now confess, should have their property confiscated and should be sent in chains by assignment to Caesar's estate. The Emperor Valerian also added to this address a copy of the letters which he sent to the presidents of the provinces concerning us, which letters we are daily hoping will come, waiting according to the strength of our faith for the endurance of suffering, and expecting from the help and mercy of the Lord the crown of eternal life. But know that Zixtus was martyred in the cemetery on the eighth day of the Idus of August, and with him four deacons. Moreover, the prefects in the city are daily urging on this persecution, so that, if any are presented to them, they are martyred, and their property claimed by the treasury. I beg that these things may be known by your means to the rest of our colleagues, that everywhere, by their exhortation, the brotherhood may be strengthened and prepared for the spiritual conflict, that every one of us may think less of death than of immortality, and, dedicated to the Lord with full faith and entire courage, may rejoice rather than fear in this confession, wherein they know that the soldiers of God in Christ are not slain, but crowned. I bid you, dearest brother, ever heartily farewell in the Lord. Epistle 82. To the clergy and people concerning his retirement, a little before his martyrdom. Argument. When, near the end of his life, Cyprian, on returning to his gardens, was told that messengers were sent to take him for punishment to Utica, he withdrew. And lest it should be thought that he had done so from fear of death, he gives the reason in this letter, viz. that he might undergo his martyrdom nowhere else than at Carthage in the sight of his own people. Cyprian, to the presbyters and deacons, and all the people, greeting, when it had been told to us, dearest brethren, that the Gaolers had been sent to bring me to Utica, and I had been persuaded by the counsel of those dearest to me to withdraw for a time from my garden, as a just reason was afforded, I consented, for the reason that it is fit for a bishop in that city in which he presides over the church of the Lord, there to confess the Lord, and that the whole people should be glorified by the confession of their prelate in their presence. For whatever, in that moment of confession, the confessor bishop speaks, he speaks in the mouth of all, by inspiration of God. But the honor of our church, glorious as it is, will be mutilated if I, a bishop, placed over another church, receiving my sentence or my confession at Utica, should go thence as a martyr to the Lord, when, indeed, both for my own sake and yours, I pray with continual supplications and with all my desires entreat that I may confess among you and there suffer and thence depart to the Lord even as I ought. Therefore, here in a hidden retreat, I await the arrival of the proconsul returning to Carthage, that I may hear from him what the emperors have commanded upon the subject of Christian laymen and bishops, and may say what the Lord will wish to be said at that hour. But do you, dearest brethren, according to the discipline which you have ever received from me out of the Lord's commands, and according to what you have so very often learnt from my discourse, keep peace and tranquility, nor let any of you stir up any tumult for the brethren, or voluntarily offer himself to the Gentiles. For when apprehended and delivered up, he ought to speak, inasmuch as the Lord abiding in us speaks in that hour, who willed that we should rather confess than profess. But for the rest, what it is fitting that we should observe before the proconsul passes sentence on me for the confession of the name of God, we will, with the instruction of the Lord, arrange in common. May our Lord make you, dearest brethren, to remain safe in his church, and condescend to keep you. So be it, through his mercy. End of Epistles of Cyprian by Cyprian 
Translated by Robert Wallace. Read by David Ronald.